Okay, so in the last lecture, we began our introduction to the study of, of partial differential equations. And so today we're going to continue with a little bit more introductory material in, in the first part of the lecture, which will concern the kind of basic notation and terminology that's commonly used when talking about partial differential equations. And then in the second part of the lecture, we'll move on to start studying specific equations, uh, in particular first order uh, linear partial differential equations, and we'll develop a method to actually solve these in a variety of, of situations. Uh, and then we'll, well, this will probably take about two lectures, so we'll continue this discussion in, in the third lecture as well. Um, right, and so when you're, you're studying a, a new topic in math, uh, unfortunately, there's usually a period where you have to spend a lot of time learning uh, uh, a bunch of the, the new terminology and the new notation and, and so on, and so this is what, what this section will, will cover. Uh, right, and so sort of the, the, the uh, one of the central objects at, at the study of partial differential equations is something called a, a differential operator. And so well, what is a, a differential operator? Let's define it precisely. Uh, so a, a differential operator Uh, for us, <clears throat> excuse me, is going to be a certain rule that will involving derivatives and things like this that will transform one function into a new function, right? So I'm going to call this a rule, say script L, uh, that transforms a given function into another function. Right? So say it transforms a function u which is some, like say u is equal to sine of x plus y or something like this uh, into another function, which we'll call L of u. Right, and so, well, you wanna think of this, this I'll look at it, we'll look at more examples in, in a second, uh, but you wanna think of this kind of intuitively, you wanna think of this differential operator as kind of like a function but it's not a function on numbers or on, on vectors. Instead, it's a function whose input are, is other functions, right? And so you, you have some given function u, and the differential operator L will transform u into a new function, uh, right? So what's an example? Let me <clears throat> define my operator L to be the rule which says uh, take derivative with respect to x and then add that to derivative with respect to y. Right, and so let's suppose that u is some, some given function of x and y. Uh, so how does this operator act? Well, I transform u to L of u, where L of u is given by applying these rules uh, to u, right? So apply d dx plus d dy to u. Distribute this like you would distribute multiplication uh, of numbers, so this ends up being d dx of u plus d dy of u, right? Or in, in shorthand, ux plus ui, right? So this is exactly a, a kind of a, a good example of exactly what, what these things are, right? So I have an input function and, and a rule associated with my operator and the rule says transform my input function into this quantity here. This is a new function, right? It, it depends on u in some way, but it's still a new function because I've taken derivatives of my uh, original function. Right. And so let's look at one other uh, quick example. Uh, so let's say instead we define L to be uh, now not d dx plus d dy, but instead derivative with respect to x, uh, say plus xy times derivative with respect to y. And so when you see this, when you see any sort of other, this is like the function uh, xy, right? And so when you see this, you're going to treat it like you're multiplying by, by numbers, right? So uh, let's say I apply this to a given function u as before. Well, now I'm going to be applying this operation, which is take derivative with respect to x and add that to xy times derivative with respect to y, right? Apply it to u. And so now, I'm, again, I'm going to distribute this like I would distribute multiplication. And then whenever a derivative operation hits my function, that means take the derivative. Uh, 
and then when there, whenever there are other things lying around like x times y, that just, just means multiply by x times y, right? So this is gonna end up being uh, distributed like you would multiplication, d dx of u plus the function x times y times the y derivative of u, right? And so in shorthand, this is ux plus xy times ui. Uh, maybe it'll help if I actually use a, a, an explicit function. So let's say uh, u is equal to x squared plus y squared, right? And so let's say I apply this differential operator here, right? So well, in this case, L of u is given by, well, I take the x derivative of u, which is the x derivative of, of x squared plus y squared. And then I add this to x times y times the y derivative of u, right? And so now I can evaluate this. So the first term is just equal to 2x. And the second term, well, the second term is xy times the y derivative, which is 2y. And so in this case, for this particular function, uh, the differential operator takes x squared plus y squared and it outputs uh, this quantity, which we just calculated, which is 2x plus 2x times y squared. Um, Okay, and so right. The reason we're introducing these is because uh, all the par partial differential equations we'll, we're going to be studying throughout the semester can be characterized as some kind of equation involving a differential operator, and this is the way that that mathematicians will typically talk about about these equations, right? So, for example, let's say we have the uh, the PD. Let's just continue with the example from above, and let's say we have a, a partial differential equation, say. Uh, derivative with respect to x of u plus xy times derivative with respect to y of u is equal to zero. Well, I can describe this just in terms uh, of, of a differential operator, right? So it can be described more succinctly, uh, let's just say compactly. Uh, as uh, L u is equal to zero, where L is just the operation from before, right? So L is given by this differential operator. Okay. Okay. And so throughout the semester, we'll be talking about our, our, our equations from, from this perspective. Uh, right. Okay, and so maybe one more example, let's say we look at something called the uh, for reasons what we'll review in a second, this is typically called the nonlinear uh, wave equation. And so this is a partial differential equation. So now my function u will be a function of say x and t, where t is usually thought of uh, as time. And so one particular instance of this nonlinear wave equation is the following. So let's define uh, L to be, uh, take the second derivative with respect to t, uh, Actually, let me let me do this in a, in a different way. So I'm going to define my my operator not as I did in, in the previous example, but I'm just going to define it like uh, how does it act on the function. So let me define L of u to be right. So the input is just an arbitrary function uh, u of x and t, uh, which has some. Well, we're assuming all these functions are differentiable and things like this. Uh, and so the rule, which is my my the differential operator for this nonlinear wave equation, is you you input this function u and you output the second derivative of u with respect to t uh, minus the second derivative of u with respect to x, and then plus some other term, say, u cubed. Okay. And so this is going to be my, my differential operator <clears throat> for this example. Right, and so this fits the definition we had previously, right? All we're saying is it's a certain rule that will take one function and transform it into another function, uh, typically involving derivatives. Right? Maybe I should add that. Otherwise, it, the differential doesn't really make, make sense here as a name.
Right, and so this is uh, another example, which now has not just derivatives, but also say the cubed of the input, which is being added on here, uh, right? And so, well, if I look at the, the following PDE, uh, which is given as the equation I have here, say set equal to zero, or I can write this as uh, UTT minus U X X is equal to U uh, minus U cubed, right? Well, we can write this as using our differential operator in a, in a more compact form, right? So we can write this as uh, just as LU is equal to zero, right? So there, again, there's some operator and then we've simplified the, the expression of our equation just as this operator applied to our function is equal to zero. Right. And so this, as I said a second ago, this equation is, is an ex a version of the wave equation, which I, I briefly mentioned in the last lecture, but it's more complicated because I've added on some, some cubic term here. Uh, so why is this called nonlinear? Well, we're going to go over that uh, in, in a second. Okay, and so well, let's let's do that now. Uh, so we're going to right. So so this is the basic definition of what a differential operator are uh, is, and so it turns out that there are essentially two important classes of, of differential operators, uh, and so this has to do with whether or not they are linear. And so we're going to talk about linearity. And so if you've taken a class in linear algebra, the, the concept of linearity that I'm going to talk about now is exactly the same as for matrix transformations or linear transformations, if, if you're familiar with these, except now the domain is not going to be vectors, but it's going to be things acting on functions. But otherwise, the definition should be, should be similar. Uh, so let's suppose that we have uh, a particular PDE. I think of any of the examples from above. Uh, which is written in the form, uh, say, LU is equal to zero, where L is some differential operator. Um, right, and so the operator, uh, say, L is said to be linear if, if two conditions hold. Right, so the first condition is, let's say instead of plugging in one particular function u to my operator, I plug in a sum of two functions, say L of u plus b. Well, I want this to split as the sum of L of u, L applied to u plus L applied to v. Right. So this is the first condition, which is like the, the uh, additivity condition. Right. And so the second condition concerns uh, scalar or constant multiplication. Uh, so the second condition is, well, if C is any constant, then I can factor out the constant from my, uh, from my equation, right? So then if I apply my operator to C times U, where U is a function and C is a, a constant, which doesn't depend on any of the variables used to define U, uh, then this is equal to C times L of U. Right. And so, right, so once again, I have a particular linear operator which is given to me. Uh, I'm looking at, at this equation, LU is equal uh, to zero. Right, and so while we say that this particular operator is linear if these two conditions are satisfied. Right, and so uh, what's an example of a linear operator? Well, let's just use one of the examples considered above. Uh, so let's say L is given by this operation where you take derivative with respect to X and then you add on X times Y times derivative with respect to Y. Right. Uh, so this is linear. And so let's uh, see why. Right. And so let's, let's write this as, as like a proof. Right. And so how do you prove that, that a particular operator that's given to you uh, is linear, well, you have to check two conditions, right? You check condition one and condition two, and if both are true, then uh, it's linear, right? So let's check condition one. Uh, so let's apply, suppose u and v are, are any two functions. Uh, 
right? Well, now we're going to form a new function by adding u and v together, right? And so by definition, this is equal to uh, this operation applied to the sum of these two functions, right? Where I'm thinking of u plus v as, as uh, Sorry, there's a, a bug with the with the tablet. Uh, where I'm thinking of u plus v as a single function, right, which is given by the sum of these two other functions, right. And so if I distribute uh, as I did before, well, this is going to be given by d dx of, of u plus v plus x y times d dy of u plus v. But now we know that if you take the derivative of a sum, then that's going to be a sum of derivatives. Right, so I can write this as uh, ux plus vx and for the first term. And then in the second term, I have xy on the outside times uy plus vy. But now I can distribute this multiplication with the addition. And so this is going to end up being uh, ux plus vx plus uh, xy uy plus xy vy. And now let me rearrange this in terms of u and v, right? So collect terms involving a u and collect terms involving v. So this is ux plus xy times ui uh, plus vx plus xy times vy. Uh, but the first term in parentheses is just lu, right? This is l applied to u. And the second term in parentheses is l applied to v. And so, well, since these were all equalities, we have L of u plus v is equal to L of u plus L of v. And so this shows that the first condition is OK. Uh, and then using a very similar argument, which I'm, I guess I'll, right, let's just do this very, very quickly. You can also check uh, condition two. Right, so now let's look at, suppose C is just any, any scalar and u is any function in the domain of the operator. Uh, well, let's look at L of C times U, right? So by definition, this is D DX uh, plus X Y D D Y applied not to U, but applied to the function, which is given by C times U. Uh, but once again, we're just going to apply the rule and distribute and, and things will work out. Um, so this is given as D DX of C U plus xy times d dy of cu, right? But now, since c is a constant with respect to x and y, when I take derivatives, I can just factor it out, right? And so this is just c times derivative of u. Well, I can factor out the c. Uh, so this is c times xy times derivative with respect to y of u. And so once again, once again I can factor out c one more time, and I'm left with c times ux plus xy uy. And of course, this is C times L of U, just using the definition. And so this is a, an example of a linear uh, operator. Right? So we, we check condition two. Right, so going back up here, we verified that this is uh, a linear operator. OK, and one thing that's, that's worth pointing out here is notice that this is not a linear function here. Right, so here you want to be a little careful. So you can have a linear operator, even though there are nonlinear functions which show up in the description. Uh, right, so usually the linear operators are going to be any combination of uh, differentiation operations along with maybe multiplication by some function functions which don't depend on you. Right, so even though this x y is not a linear function of x and y, since it doesn't depend on on you it ends up being okay, as you saw in the calculation that we did. And this kind of boils down to the fact that the operation of multiplying by functions is, is kind of a linear operation, even if the functions themselves are not linear. Uh, if that went over your head, that's, that's okay. I mean, you can, the, the best thing to do in, in any case until you get used to the hang of this is to just check both conditions kind of line by line. And you, if you do a few examples, you'll, you'll get the hang of it, hopefully. 
Okay, and so that's an example of a linear operator. What's an example of, of something that is not linear? Right, so definition, if your different, differential operator L is not linear, uh, it's called uh, nonlinear, right? And so as an example, let's return to what I called the, the nonlinear wave equation. So let's say my operator is defined by L of U is given by uh, UTT minus UXX plus U cubed. Right, so this is second derivative with respect to T of U uh, minus second derivative with respect to X of U plus U cubed. Right? So this is nonlinear. Uh, right, and so how do you prove that, that something is not linear? Well, you, you prove it by just showing that one of these two conditions has to fail, right? So if it were linear, then by definition, both of these have to be true. And so if you can show that a single one of them is false, then it can't be linear, right? So this is what you have to do. Uh, so what we're gonna do is uh, show that, that property two fails, which is the, the scalar multiple condition. Okay. And so how do you do this? Well, let's, uh, let's just pick any U. And uh, let's say we take C not equal to zero, any scalar C that's not equal to zero. Uh, let's look at L of applied to CU, right? So this is the same thing as a uh, second derivative with respect to T of C times U. Right, just using the definition up here, uh, minus second derivative with respect to x of c times u, and then finally plus uh, c times u cubed. Right. Okay, well, for the first two terms, these are just derivatives. c doesn't depend on x or t, so I can factor these out. And so this is c times uh, utt minus c times u xx. But the third term here is where we're, gonna, we're going to run into a problem. Uh, so this is uh, c, c cubed times u cubed, right? And so I can factor a c out of this expression, uh, but if I do, I'm gonna get c times utt minus u xx, and then plus c squared times u, uh, u cubed, right? And so this is where the problem is. So this thing here is not uh, L applied to U. And so what we have here, for example, let's say we just let C equal two or something like this. Uh, so this is not equal to uh, C times LU. Right? And so therefore, well, we started with L applied to CU and we showed that this cannot be equal to C times LU. And so therefore uh, property two fails. And so the equation can't be linear. Okay, and so something to point out is that typically, I mean, it's worth when you're learning this to actually try to go through proofs like I just did and actually check all the conditions. You'll have a few homework problems involving this. Uh, but kind of a, a rule of thumb is that typically uh, operators that involve higher order powers of the input, right? So things like uh, say u squared, u cubed, et cetera, or maybe some function of u, uh, like say sine of, of u, uh, e to the u and so on, or maybe similar things involving derivatives, like maybe like ux, u squared, uh, maybe y derivative squared, et cetera. So things involving other functions of your input, right? So that aren't just linear functions of your input or derivatives, uh, these will be nonlinear equations or nonlinear operators. Right, so if you have a particular differential operator that's given to you and you see like u squared or you see some function of u, which is not just the, the ident identity function or a derivative operation, or you see like a, some like derivative of u times u squared or derivative of u squared or something like this, usually these are all obstructions to linearity. Uh, there are a lot of very important partial differential equations that look like this, uh, but they're not linear equations. They're called nonlinear uh, equations. 
Right, and, and so the, the final thing to add here is uh, definition, uh, a PDE of the form, uh, say LU is equal to zero is called linear if L is a linear operator in the sense just described above. Uh, otherwise, the equation is called a nonlinear partial differential equation. Okay. Okay, and so we're we're almost done with kind of the basic terminology that we need to to use to talk about uh, partial differential equations. Uh, there's one more definition which I want to actually two more things I want to talk about before we move on and actually start solving uh, equations. Uh, so the first is just kind of an extension of what we actually they're both going to be extensions of what we were just talking about. Uh, and so now I just want to briefly talk about uh, this notion of homogeneous versus non homogeneous equations, which is something you're, you might be familiar with from an, an ordinary differential equations class. And so now we're going to suppose that we have uh, L, which is a, a linear uh, differential operator. Um, right, and so we're going to consider two equations. Uh, so let's suppose that uh, G is a fixed function that's given to you. Right, so for example, maybe uh, think of G as something like uh, sine of x squared plus y or something like this. Right, it's just some some arbitrary, but so I, I shouldn't use the word arbitrary, some, some function that's given to you, right? Uh, right, so the equation, let's just look at the equation LU equals zero as we have been doing above. This is called the, the homogeneous and linear, uh, the homogeneous linear equation. Uh, on the other hand, if you consider it not, not LU equal to zero, but LU equal to this function G, this is called uh, non-homogeneous. Uh, linear equation. Right, and so it's important here that, that this doesn't depend, that G doesn't depend on U in any way. So it's some fixed function, which is independent of U, where U is the input to the equation. Right, and so for example, let's consider, let's say the linear wave equation from before. Right, so if I have something like UTT minus UXX equals zero, this is the linear, and of one case of the linear homogeneous uh, wave equation, which we briefly introduced in the last lecture, and we'll talk about more over the next few weeks. Uh, on the other hand, if I use the same equation in terms of derivatives, UTT minus UXX, but instead I say this is equal to sine of x squared plus t. This is now a linear uh, non-homogeneous uh, wave equation. Right. So non-homogeneous again just means there's some extra function that's that's given to you which doesn't depend on u and you have some combination of say derivatives of u may be multiplied by some other functions which are all equal to this this extra function like sine of x squared plus t in this example. Okay, and so one final thing that I wanna talk about. So what is one reason why it's, it's so important to isolate this concept of linearity uh, like why have, why have I spent like the first giant section of, of, of this lecture going over in detail like this notion of linearity? Uh, well, this will become apparent throughout the, the semester how powerful linearity is if you if you have it right. And so it's something that we're going to take advantage of many times to solve a variety of different equations on different domains. 
Uh, and, and so it all will sort of boil down to something which is known as the superposition principle. Uh, and so this is essentially the principle that says, suppose I have a bunch of solutions to a linear partial differential equation. Well, if I add them all together, I get a, another solution to the partial differential equation. Uh, right, so, so let's suppose that we have a, a linear partial differential equation, which is given by say L of U is equal to zero. For L, you can think of any, any linear operator from above, maybe this, or maybe some of the other examples. Uh, if you want to, maybe pause the lecture and write, write down some examples to help you uh, work through this. Um, right, and suppose uh, we also have uh, two functions, say u and, and v, which solve the equation. Right, so u and v are two different functions which are solutions to the PDE in the sense that when I apply this linear operator to them, I get zero, right? So L of u is zero and L of v is zero. Uh, well, notice that if I look at L of u plus v, then since this is linear, this is equal to using property one equal to L of u plus L of uh, v. But I'm assuming that, that both of these solve the equation, which means each of these has to be zero, right? So this is equal to zero plus zero, which is zero. And so this tells me that if I let W be the sum of U plus V, then W is also a solution. Right? And so this tells us then that the sum of two solutions is another solution. Right. And so this sum is like a superposition of the two functions, right? Maybe these functions are like some kind of oscillating waves and you take the superposition of the two waves. Well, if both of these waves obey a certain partial differential equation, then their sum has to also whenever the equation is linear, right? And so later on in the semester, what we're gonna do to solve a lot of equations is we're gonna start with certain building blocks, which will solve the equation in certain simplified cases. And then we'll form more general solutions by adding these blocks together and exploiting the super superposition property to, to do that. Uh, right. Uh, so it's, it's worth remarking that this is not the most general uh, form, right? So in fact, let's say we have uh, a list of different solutions, say U1, U2, U3, and so on, up to say UN, with all of them solving the equation. Um, Right, so for each j, l applied to u, j is zero. Uh, then if I define a new function w by letting w be the sum of some constants cj times uj, where cj are any constants, uh, then by linearity, w will also be a solution. Uh, right, so L of W, which is L applied to this whole sum of functions. Well, you can show that even though, right, if we go back to these properties, uh, these properties were only given for sums of two functions or, or maybe a, a L applied to a scalar. But what you can do is keep using this, right? So if this is say a sum of four functions, well, I can break this up as L applied to the first two plus L applied to the second two, but then I can break those two up further, right? And so you'll get a sum of four terms and you can do this for any number of, of terms, right? So you're basically using the additivity or this constant scalar property over and over multiple times. And so if you do this, again, maybe it will, it'll be helpful uh, if you haven't seen something like, like this before to maybe pause the lecture and try to work this out and, and think about it using the definition from before. You can show that this will, will simplify to the sum j equals one to n of L applied to CJ UJ using the additivity condition multiple times. Uh, but then now if I use the scalar condition for each term, I can factor out the CJ. So this is gonna be sum from J equals one to N 
of CJ applied to the CJ times L applied to UJ, but L applied to UJ is zero for each J, right? And so if this is zero, well, a sum, it doesn't matter what N is, the sum of N zeros is always zero. So this is equal to zero. And so W solves the equation. Right. And so this means that if I have a, a bunch of different tiny solutions to my equation, I can construct a more general solution by taking like an, say, like nth order, uh, nth order sum, right? Like say I have a million small pieces that are easier to understand. And I form a more, I can form a more complicated solution by adding those all together. Uh, if the equation is linear, right? if the equation is not linear, then the superposition principle fails. And this is one of the reasons why nonlinear equations turn out to be harder to understand than, than linear equations. Uh, okay. And so, right. So that's, that's all the, the introductory material uh, I wanted to cover for now. Uh, and so what we're going to do is now move on and talk about uh, our first class of, of partial differential equations, which we're going to solve. And so now we're going to be studying uh, certain linear equations, in particular, uh, first order linear equations. Okay. And so what is a, a first order uh, linear equation? Well, we're going to be considering uh, PDEs of the following form. Right, so we're gonna have, they're gonna be first order because they're just gonna involve uh, first derivatives, say derivative with respect to X of U X Y and derivative with respect to y of some function u of x, y, where u, u is a function of two variables, x and y. Uh, and so we're going to look at equations which are combinations of, of terms like this. And maybe there's some other function, say a of x, y times the first term plus some other function b of x, y times the second term, all equal to zero. Right? Where a of x, y and b of x, y are functions which are given to you. And u is, is uh, unknown. And so we want, we'll be in a situation where you, you're given some function a and some function b. You're given this equation then where u is unknown and you want to find a function with u which solves the equation, uh, assuming you know what a and b are. Okay, so what we're going to do, and this is a, I mean, this is, this is a typical uh, method for approaching something like this, is well, you can sort of assume that this problem is going to be harder to solve if a and b are more complicated functions, and so let's first try to understand this problem in a simplified case, in particular when a and b are just constants, right? And so what we're going to do is first look at the the constant coefficient case. Right. So let's first suppose that A and B are just constants. Okay. So in this case, we can rewrite the, the partial differential equation in, in the following way. Uh, so say A times uh, UX plus B times UY is equal to zero. Okay. Okay, and what we're going to do is first first solve the equation in, in this simplified case. Right, and so the idea here is to use some, of course, some tools from for multivariable calculus. And in particular, we're going to use some some geometric observations which are related to uh, directional derivatives. And so kind of the, the key idea is to observe that the left hand side uh, can be written in, in the vector notation using the dot product, right? So I have a vector, say, ux at my point xy, comma, uy at my point xy, and I'm taking the dot product with a, comma, b, right? And this is all set equal to 0, right? But there's a special name for the vector which has 
the first partial derivative and the first component and the second partial derivative and the second component. This is just the gradient of u, right? Right. So this is the gradient of u at, at the point x comma y. And I'm taking the dot product with this vector a comma b, where a and b are two constants which were given to me. And so this is all set equal to zero. Okay. Okay, well, this has certain geometric meaning. Uh, so you may recognize the quantity on the left as the directional derivative of u in direction a, b. Right. So over here, the left hand side is the directional derivative. of u in direction x comma y, or sorry, in direction a comma b at point x, y. Right, and so more intuitively speaking, what is the, what, uh, what is the, or just to kind of review, what does the directional derivative mean? Well, this quantity measures the rate of change of your function u as you move in the direction given by a comma b, right? So you pick a point in the plane and you move in the direction given by this vector here. This quantity measures the rate your function changes in that direction. Uh, well, this says that the rate of change is zero, right? So that means that u has to be, it doesn't change if you move in that direction. And so this means that u has to be constant if you move in this direction, right? And so I'm going to go over this in a, little, in a little bit more detail now, but we're basically going to exploit this fact to find a, a solution. Right, and so if you look at this equation, well, it's also true that if I multiply by uh, the equation by negative one, then I'm going to get the uh, uh, the left hand side will still be equal to zero. So it's actually true that that plus or minus the directional derivative is equal to zero, and so that means that um, in fact the de the directional derivative in either direction a comma b or minus a comma b uh, has to be zero at, at each point uh, x comma y. Right. And so let's try to understand a little bit more geometrically what this what this means. And so let's say this is the uh, the x y plane, and say this is my point A, and this is my point B, right? And so right over here is going to be the point A comma B, and so the direction A B is given by uh, by this direction. Uh, well, what does it mean that the directional derivative is zero? Uh, in direction a comma b at each point, it means that if I, if I fix a particular point and I move in the direction given by uh, this vector, then my function has to remain constant, right? Because since the directional derivative is zero, there's no change. And so if there's no change, u has to remain uh, constant, right? So in particular, uh, value of u, Whatever my solution u is, it's some function of x and y. I don't know what it is, but I at least know now that the value of u must remain constant uh, if x comma y moves in direction uh, a comma b, right? And so, for example, let's suppose that. Okay, let me just clear this up a little. Let's suppose that this is my point that I'm that I'm looking at in the plane. Say x comma y is this point up here. Uh, well, what we see is that if I start at this point and I move parallel to this orange vector, so moving in the direction a comma b, starting at this point, like say something like this. Well, as long as I move, stay along this line, which is the line in the same direction, uh, u must remain constant. Right? Say u is equal to c1, which is some constant. Right? And as we remarked a, a minute ago, this is also true if we move in the opposite direction, right? If we look at the minus sign. So if I also move in, uh, in the opposite direction, uh, u must remain constant as well, right? And so in particular, at any, any line uh, in direction uh, a comma b, as I move along that line, you must, you can't, the value of u can't change, right? And so now it's the case that each point in the plane will have a unique line in direction a comma b 
running through that point. And so the value of u at that point will be determined by what that line is. And so we're going to take advantage of this idea to, to find a solution formula. Um, and so let's, let's just, uh, to elaborate on this before I start writing down formulas, let's just look at one other case. Uh, so say instead uh, the point was over here. You say this is like x tilde, y tilde. Um, well, now if I, let's say I start at this point, what's the line in direction A comma B through this? It will look something like, like this. Right? I'm not gonna, these aren't gonna be exactly parallel because I'm drawing by hand, but you can always imagine they're parallel. And so along this line, as long as I stay on this line, the value of U can't change. So it's maybe some other constant C2, right? Now notice that on, on different lines, the values could be different, right? There could, it could be equal to say 10 over here and five over here. But the key point is that as long as I stay along this line, the value can't change, right? Okay, and so, right, so what's the, let me, let me get the, the main, sort of the main idea uh, in writing, and then we're going to, we're going to see how to use the, this idea to, uh, to solve the equations. Uh, right, so the value, say, u of xy, where xy is any point in the plane, so say, looking at the picture above, uh, this only depends on the line uh, through your point in direction a comma b. Right. So any point in the plane will have a unique line in direction a comma b that passes through it. There are many lines that have, or sorry, there are many points that have the, that are on the same line, but nevertheless, each point has a unique line that passes through it in direction a comma b. Uh, and so the value of u at a point only depends on what particular line that is, right? So in some sense, u is a function of, of these lines, which are translates of the line through the origin in direction a comma a comma b, right? And so what we're going to do is, well, let's let's try to write down the equations of these lines and see how we can vary. Uh, if we can find a parameter that describes these lines and then you will be a function of that parameter because it can't really be a function of anything else. Um, right, and so let's, uh, let's try to write down, write down the equations. Well, these lines have equation uh, well, y is equal to b over a x plus r, where r is the intercept, right, and b over a is the slope. Right. Why is b over a the slope? Well, remember the slope is just the change in y over the change in x. And so if we're moving in direction a comma b, the change in y over change in x is b over a, right? And so the slope of this uh, line here is, is b over a. And since these are all parallel, they all have the same slope, possibly with different intercepts. And so you get, uh, you get this equation. Uh, and so let me rearrange this equation, say assuming a is not equal to zero. This says that a times y is equal to bx plus c, where c is equal to ar. So c is related to the intercept in some way. Uh, and so I can rearrange this further as ay minus bx is equal to c. Right? And so these are the equations of my different lines. And so each value of c here, which is just an arbitrary constant, uh, gives a different line. And so this parameter C here will parameterize all the lines that are parallel to the line through the origin in direction A comma B. And from the, the previous discussion, well, we know that on each of these lines, U must remain constant, although it could take different values on, on distinct lines, right? And so the idea is, well, this parameter C describes all these lines and U, U take, uh, <clears throat> U is somehow like a function of these lines rather than a function of the point, right? And so we would expect that maybe U is some function of this constant C, or sorry, of this parameter C. Right? So 
So we expect u is equal to f of c for some function f. Right? And again, the reason is that uh, the value of u at a point only depends on which particular line it's the point is on in direction a comma b. And these lines are determined by the value of c, right? So changing this value of c will give you a different line. And so that could give you a different value of u. Uh, but if this value of c is fixed, then you won't change. So you should just be equal to a fixed value, uh, right? Okay, well, we know what c is in terms of x and y because we have that equation just written out right here, right? And so this says we expect u of x, y should be equal to f of a, y minus b, x uh, for some function f. Right. And so, well, technically, this function f, notice that a, y minus b, x is just a number. Right. So this function f has to be a function of a single variable because its input is just one real number, not a vector. Uh, but u is nevertheless a function of two variables because I've plugged in two separate variables into the domain of f. Okay, so there's kind of a subtle distinction there, which may take a little bit of, of getting used to. Um, okay, and so I, well, at this point, uh, well, this is kind of our, our abstract solution formula. Uh, so remember, we're looking at the equation. Uh, uh, a times ux plus b times ui is equal to zero, right? And so this is our, our solution formula. Uh, now, if we want to actually determine what the function f is, well, in general, you're not going to be able to um, uh, you're not going to be able to figure out what the function f is unless you have more information, right? And so, in particular, the function f is going to be determined by some initial condition, which is which is given to you. Uh, and so we're going to go over this in, in, in a minute, but I just want to maybe frame this as, as like a theorem. Um, right? So let me write this uh, as a theorem, which is our basic uh, first order constant coefficient uh, solution formula, which is um, suppose u is a solution. Or sorry, let, let me let me reframe this. So let's say let's uh, consider the partial differential equation. Um, a times u x plus b times u y is equal to zero, uh, where a and b are constants. Right. Then if f is any function, in the sense above. Uh, u of x, y equals f of a, y minus b, x uh, solves the PDE, right? So in particular, for any function you want, as long as it's a function of a, of a single variable, when you plug in a, y minus b, x to that function, that gives you a solution to this equation. And in particular, there are, there are infinitely many solutions, one for each different function, as long as it's differentiable, uh, right? And so we're naturally led to this formula using kind of the, the geometric analysis from up here related to the, the property of the, of the directional derivative. Yeah. Okay, and so what I'm gonna do is, well, let's prove this. Uh, you could say, okay, well, we, we kind of proved it above already. Why are we proving it again? Well, what I'm gonna do is just, I'm just gonna explicitly check that this formula works, right? So we use some geometric reasoning and some intuition to try to kind of arrive at this formula Let's actually prove that the formula works just using the chain rule by, by differentiating, right? And so let's take derivative with respect to x of u, assume, assuming that u is given by, by this formula. Well, this is equal to derivative with respect to x of f of a y minus b x, right? If I use the chain rule, this is given by minus b times f prime of a y minus b x, right? On the other hand, if I look at derivative with respect to y of u, this is derivative with respect to y of f of a y minus bx. Once again, I'm going to use the chain rule, and I end up now with a times f prime of a y minus bx. Right. 
And so, well, what happens if I look at, um, well, then a times ux, I'm just going to multiply this term here by a. This is equal to minus a b times f prime at this input. On the other hand, b times u ui is equal to now a times b of f prime. And well, if I add these two things together, of course, I'm going to get zero because they're the negative of one another. Right, so this formula works. Right, so that's the proof. Um, right, and so to to end to end the lecture, let's let's kind of. Uh, I mean, everything here is kind of abstract. Like we're looking at arbitrary a and b, arbitrary functions f. Let's let's look at a, a particular example. Uh, so suppose. Uh, or let me reframe this. Uh, so find a solution to the following. Uh, so find a function u of x, y, such that, uh, say, the x derivative of u is equal to 2 fifths times the y derivative of u, and such that, um, Say when y is equal to zero, u is equal to e to the x. And so this is what's called the, the initial condition. Right. So remember from last time, uh, the initial condition uh, initial conditions for partial differential equations will be functions, right? They're not going to necessarily be constants, they could just be kind of generic functions. And so in this case, our initial condition will be when y is equal to zero, u of x is equal to e to the x. Okay, and so what we're going to do is use the the previous theorem or the previous uh, solution formula, and so let's rearrange uh, this equation so that it looks like a first order linear equation in the sense described above. Uh, so the PDE becomes, if I just do some algebra, uh, the equation becomes five times u x minus two times u y is equal to zero, and so now this means my my parameter a is equal to five and b is equal to two, right? And so from before, we know that u is equal to some function f of, well, what was the formula? a times y minus b times x. So this is 5y minus 2x uh, for some function f. Right. And so how do we know what f is? Well, now we're going to use the, the this initial condition. Right. Right, and so in particular, the initial condition says that e to the x has to equal u of x comma zero, right? Well, I know that u is given by this expression here. And so this is equal to f of five. Well, now y is set equal to zero, so it's five times zero minus two x. And so this is equal to f of, of minus two x. Right? And so at this point, I don't quite know what f is, but I'm, I'm on track to determining what, what f is. And in particular, this says that whenever I plug in minus 2x to my function f, I have to output e to the x. And so this tells me that uh, f of minus 2x has to equal e to the x. And so what we're going to do is basically kind of invert this, the variables in this equation to, to figure out what f is. Uh, and so let's say that. Let's let me let z equal minus two x, for example. Um, well, if z is equal to minus two x, this means that x has to equal minus z over two. And so if I use z in place of x, this says that f of z on the left hand side has to equal e to the minus z over two. Okay. And so this is a formula for my function. Okay. And so this says that whenever I input a number z into my function, it has to output e to the minus z over two. So f is the function e to the minus z over two. Okay. And so while well, we're almost done, so then well from before we know that u of x comma y is equal to um, f of uh, five y minus two x. 
well, now I know what this function f does. It takes the input and it raises, it plugs that, that in, it replaces z here by this input. And so my function u is going to be e to the minus, now z is going to be replaced by 5y minus 2x uh, divided by 2. Right, and so this is my solution. And so now this actually is a concrete explicit uh, function with, and the reason we were able to get like an actual function as an answer is because we specified um, a certain initial condition. Yeah. Okay, and so this, this process that we've, uh, we've begun looking at here, uh, which kind of boils down to these geometric observation about the directional derivative. Uh, so this is known as the, the method of characteristics And so these lines here are called the, the characteristic lines. Okay. And so what we're going to do beginning in, in the next lecture is look at, well, we've only looked at the constant coefficient case. So what we'll do is extend this method of characteristics to the, uh, the so-called variable coefficient case, where a and b are now allowed to be functions of x and y as well. And it's going to, we're going to see that it's going to be very important to try to uh, this perspective about the different the directional derivative derivative is going to be very important uh, in understanding how to how to solve first order linear equations in that case. Uh, the methods are going to be very similar, except we'll see that instead of having characteristic lines, they're going to be kind of arbitrary characteristic curves along which the solution has to be constant. And uh, right, so we'll we'll see how to do that next time.